feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond in a shrimp tank. Welcome, Shrimp Tank Charleston fans. I'm Eric Elkins, host of the Shrimp Tank Charleston show and founder of Double E Financial and Insurance Solutions. The Shrimp Tank Charleston show allows us the opportunity to interview the brightest, the best entrepreneurs and executives and people around. We get to learn their stories and how they became successful, as well as their ups and downs of their journey. We are also a nationally syndicated podcast that can be heard on YouTube, Google, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio. You can also listen and subscribe to our shows on our website, www.shrimptankpodcast.com. That is hard to say. We are on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram pages, so please, please follow us. I could use some more followers. All right, let's get into this. I'm very, very excited, grateful that this gentleman has driven 90 miles, maybe 110, based on where he lives, to come be on the show For the second time, we've never had a guest awarded the opportunity to come on twice. I'm honored. And we have done this because of the demand that we've had of this gentleman that is in the Double E Studios today. He's an attorney. He's a real estate mogul. He's a lover. He's very handsome. He's a senior. He plays from the senior tees on the golf (laughs) tour. Soon to be 60 years old. Soon to be 60, but he doesn't look 60. He's very muscular. Probably has 17, 18-inch arms. Close to 19, but okay. Okay, closer to the mic. Um, his He goes by the name of Eric, with a C, of course, Bland. He is the famous attorney that, since he came on the shrimp tank a year and a half ago, his career has gone to a whole nother level because of the Murdaugh case. He blew this thing up. And I'm, I, I'm being funny because he's a good friend of mine, but all kidding aside, this thing really has blown up due to Bland and Richter Law Firm. I don't want to le- leave out Ronnie because he is your partner. I wouldn't leave him out. He's not as handsome as you are, but... Smart man, though. Very smart. And he has taken, both of you have taken this and opened up the floodgates to where this, people are making millions of dollars having podcasts and Netflix movies and shows and God knows. I just want to say before we go into this, because this whole episode is about talking about the Murdoch case. Everybody is, you know, so interested in this and and so I'm so fortunate to have Eric to get his perspective on it and to get him to share some things he's never told before. That's what's going to happen today. But the one thing I want to ask you is when the movie comes out, I think I should play you. You should. You look younger. You, we do have similar facial characteristics. Either you or Andy Garcia, but I would be happy with both. Well, you'll have to darken your hair a little bit more, though, Eric. Which Eric. Eric, E-B or E-E? E-E. Double well, E. Double E. No. <laughs> I, I would have to quit working out as much oh. because my arms are probably a little bit bigger than Eric's. But other than that, I think I could pass this. So whoever produces that movie, I want you to put my name in the hat. I will. Um, so let's talk about this. Let me, let me give a little bit of characters and cast of this Murdoch case if people aren't familiar with it. Some people, a lot of people, I, I'm guessing obviously are, but there are plenty of people who aren't. So I'm going to give you kind of the cast so everyone's kind of following. We have Alex Murdaugh. Everyone says Murdoch, but it's Murdaugh, right? Yeah, and everybody says Alex, and he it's, goes by Alec. Yeah, like, like my your son. son. Right. So Alec Murdaugh is alive, and he's in jail. He is the guy who really kind of is the kingpin of this. Then we have Maggie Murdaugh who's passed away, which was Alec's wife. She was shot and killed in 2021. June 7th. Thank you. Then we have Paul Murdaugh, who's the son of Maggie and Alex. He was shot with his mother, killed the same day, at their home in some country farm place. Brazil, South Carolina. Yeah. Collin County. Then we have Mallory Beach, who was killed in a boat crash that Paul, it appears was the main reason of what caused that 
wreck to happen from being intoxicated. That was 2019. Then we have Gloria Satterfield, which is where Eric has really kind of blown this thing up, where it kind of all started for Bland and Richter. And she is she fell, you know, mysteriously, whatever. What's the word I want to say? Mysteriously. Mysteriously, thank you. She fell, and then she passed away in 2018. And then this gentleman, Stephen Smith, who I kind of feel sorry for because he gets the least amount of credit on this whole thing or um, press. He died on the road in 2015. He was really the start of the deaths that occurred, these Kennedy affairs, basically. Then we have Richard Buster Murdoch. That's the son who's still alive. Yes, he's the only son who's alive. Then we have Parker's Convenience Store, which I feel bad for the guy who owns Parker's because... Don't feel bad for him. He's worth about $29 million or more. Okay. Those are great convenience stores, by the way. So clean. Jim Griffin, the uh, one of the attorneys for Alex Murdaugh, who's a good friend of mine. I very, very much like the gentleman. Good lawyer. Great lawyer. Dick Harpoolian, who is also one of Alex Alex attorneys who's a somewhat a pretty famous, he's also a senator of, of South Carolina. Then we have Connor Cook, who was on the boat, who has some suits going on that Mallory Beach died from. Then we have Alan Wilson, South Carolina Attorney General, involved. Then we have Curtis Edward Smith, who's a drug, drug dealer slash involved with the attempt to kill um, Alec. Cousin Eddie, known as Cousin Eddie. Oh, he's he's cousin. Thank but you. But he also was the recipient of three million dollars of Alex's stolen money over a three-year period. So that's the bit. That's one of the last mysteries that I'm going to solve. Okay, we're going to get all into this. I just want to give the cast of the folks. Then we have Sandy Smith, who is Stephen's mother, who had to raise money for his gravesite. Then we have Corey Fleming, which Eric has been very involved with him because he was an attorney who no longer has his license, I believe, correct? Yes, it's temporarily suspended, just like Alex. He was helping in this whole thing for Alec Murdoch. Then we have John Tiller, attorney for Murdoch. I don't know who he is, but... Appointed by the insurance company to represent Alex. Oh, okay. Then we have Palmetto State Bank, BB&T Bank, and B of A, Bank of America, involved in this whole thing. Then we have Eric Bland, who we fortunately have today. And then we have Ronnie Richter, who is not here today, but that's Eric's partner. Then we have Anthony Cook, who was on the boat. These are side characters. Thomas Moore, and that's about it. So that gives everybody kind of, if we mention anybody, hopefully that helps you kind of find out what's going on here, or you can relate to it. But I first want to go into Eric. First, thank you for coming back on the show and being the first sequel. Hopefully this is going to be even bigger than the first episode. Maybe this will be Rocky Two. Right. You know, Rocky right. One was excellent. Rocky Two to me was better. Rocky Three was the best. Rocky Three with Culver Lang. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No one expected. People were expecting a very serious interview, which it will be. I'll get things. Just so you guys know, if you've never listened to a show by Eric Elkins, I will make things funny, but I will get him to answer questions that no one's ever asked before of Eric. So that will happen. Now, I want to know, Eric, because you came on the show a year and a half ago and then this all kind of came about, how has your life changed, both monetarily as well as just just the exposure? Because you've been all over the news. Um, Monetarily, it's been good. Uh, I've always been very fortunate as a lawyer and made good money, uh, excellent money, but I made a lot of money in the Myrtle case and settling these lawsuits. From a publicity standpoint, it's changed because people do recognize, and when they hear my name, sometimes heads will turn. But people who knew my face but couldn't connect it to something now connect it to the Myrtle. So occasionally when I'm in the grocery store, people in my neighborhood, uh, somebody will say, hey, keep up the good work. You know, most of my career I was not a lawyer that people would uh, look at kindly because I sued lawyers. Ronnie and I sued lawyers. But now we're taking on the system and we're taking down dirty lawyers and people who are dirty uh, in the system and we're looked at um, differently. And it's 
it's kind of nice. Well, it's probably nice because before no one, you were taking down lawyers that were, you know, doing bad things, but, but they didn't get the press out. No, no, they were lawyers that you know are held in high esteem with large law firms, and other lawyers would look at us. Why would you be doing that? Why would you sue a lawyer that has a good reputation? And the reason is because we're client first of lawyers, and we take an oath to be a self-policing profession. And we always should look out for our clients. That's where our 100%, 100% fidelity should be. You know, there's the old joke that when lawyer, if a lawyer falls in a boat, the sharks will circle and let the lawyer come back in the boat. But when you're driven to protect your clients and you spend your career doing that, you may be popular with the rank and file public, but you're not popular with the bar and you're not popular with the judges. In this particular case, because... Hampton County, South Carolina, where the Murdoch firm is, was known as a judicial hellhole, where big verdicts would come out of that county or big settlements. All the defense lawyers who traditionally didn't like my partner and me now are cheering us on because we're changing that county. We're changing how the judicial uh, system is viewed. In because the for, for the, so correct me if I'm wrong, in Hampton County, which is, what, how far <clears throat> away from Charleston? Uh, it's probably about an hour and 15 minutes. It's a, it's in a small, small area of the uh, Beaufort, Hilton Head area. And the population density hasn't changed for probably 50 years. And this one law firm has reigned supreme over that, law, uh, over that county. And the Murdoch family has run the judicial system because well, they've been solicitors for 100 years. Yeah, I just don't get that. How do you have... You're, you're, you're representing both sides, basically. Well, you are. You control the system, and, and you know all of the people in the county. If, if it's a 3,500 people and it hasn't changed that number for 40 years, you know either a, a cousin of a person that's going to sit on a jury or you know the person directly. And the Myrtle Firm does everything right in the terms of they're very good lawyers, but they're connected with the community. They live there. The lawyers live close to their law office. So if there's a funeral, they always send flowers. When somebody graduates from high school, they send a gift. The law firm does an annual pig picking for the law enforcement agencies. Um, if kids ha can't afford college, they give scholarships. So they really lay the seeds and the groundwork. It's the mob. It's the mafia. It's the Gambino family. There. Not, it's not so much that. Um, they're connected to their community. We can't do that in Columbia. You can't do that in Charleston. I, I could never know all the potential jurors in Charleston County or Richland County. So when I go before a jury, they're meeting me basically for the first time. And uh, I'm not Dick Harputlian, who everybody knows who Dick's name is. So when he goes before a jury, they're going to know him. Now I have a little bit more name recognition. Is that, do you like that? Having that name recognition? Um, yes and no. Y you know, I have had some death threats and um, there are some people that aren't happy with what I have talked about publicly and what I've uncovered. And, you know, I have taken a lot of risk to my law license and things that I've said on uh, TV and in the print. Um, but it's been worth it because my charge when I got retained was to find out what happened, um, get money for my clients because $4.3 million was stolen from them, hold people accountable, and then get apologies. And I've accomplished almost all of that with my, the assistance of my partner. And we've done it in less than five, six months, Eric. Uh, it, I think it's crazy, and it just doesn't stop either. Like, no, because it's – the you know, I always say – and it's a horrible thing to say, but the Murdoch matters like venereal disease. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Well, this case has so many layers to it that when you unravel... Did you say venereal disease on... on um, I've said it on TV. On I've Mandy's... Uh, I've said it on TV. I've said it on... So that's not an exclusive thing? It's not, okay. not an exclusive. <laughs> Sorry. Um, All right. But Continue. It, 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 it's a never-ending fruitcake in a, in a way because you uncover things that it makes... Um, a new investigation, a new bank, a new banker. I mean, when you look at it, not only has Alex uh, been 
uh, publicly exposed based on what we've done in Corey Fleming and their law firms, but I exposed Palmetto State Bank. I, I, I released a deposition that I took of Chad Westendorf, who was the subsequent PR for my client's estate. He's the president of the Independent Bankers Association of South Carolina. After I released his deposition and the video of it, the day later he got fired from that position. So I have altered his lifestyle. So I don't want to say like we're the sheriffs or the police, but we have, we have made people accountable for breaching their duties to clients. Yeah, you're, you're doing what you're supposed to do. Correct. It's not – the bar should have been doing this. It's not us, my partner, and me. But when we got involved in early September of 2021 – Well, go – I want you to go there. When you got involved, how did – what happened? How did you get involved? Well, we, we're, we're lawyers that sue lawyers, and it's not a popular thing to do. So most of our work comes from referrals from other lawyers. They recognize that there's a problem, but they don't want to be the ones that will sue. And they say, well, I have a friend, Eric Bland or Ronnie Richter. You need to call him on the phone. It came from Mark Tinsley, who is a very good friend of mine, who's the lawyer for the Mallory Beach family. Mm. So he is in Allendale, South Carolina, and he was suing Alex Murdoch at the time. My clients, the Satterfields, Gloria had siblings. She, had a, uh, she has a sibling, Ginger. She has a brother, Eric, and a brother, Scott. With a K or C? Uh, it's with a C. Mm, like them. And um, what had happened is, after the Mallory Beach murder, the journalists, journalists like you, descended on Hampton County, and they started to say, who are these Murdoch's? You know, to be truthful, we've never heard of the Murdoch's, Eric. They don't come outside of their county. They, yeah. they do all of their work in that county. So they don't come usually to Charleston or, or Richland County. And so journalists wanted to find out, what's the mystique about these Murdoch's? And that's how it was uncovered that after my client died and there was a claim made, there was a petition made in the court for just a $505,000 settlement in connection with my client's death. And Mandy Matney was the first person. She's excellent, by the way. She is. She, she is fearless, tenacious, um, and she's really done a good job. And she's done a good job for our state to really uncover this. But she found that one petition. That's the only thing that's in the court records about my client's case. That, that one petition. Which is terrible. There's no orders approving settlements. There's no... Uh, uh, documents that would describe what happened, just one single petition. Well, my clients had never been told ever by their lawyers, whether it was Corey Fleming or Alex Murdoch, that there were any settlements. So three years goes by from the date of Gloria Satterfield's death, which was February 26, 2018. Which is the housekeep- was the housekeeper. Now, slash- let's, let's not just call her a housekeeper because they're good people. They're, they're ju- you know, you... People say it in such a way that they're almost insignificant, the butler or the maid. Good point. She I raised, apologize. She raised those kids. She raised Paul and Buster. They viewed her as much as their mother as they did Maggie. And not only was she a housekeeper and not only did she raise them, but they went. she went with them on vacations because she was a member of their family. Well, three years goes by, and there's no word to the family that there was any settlements. What would the what would they doing during this? Like the family? Yeah, like they're fear. They live in fear so because th- you don't call Alex Murdoch or Corey Fleming and say, "Hey, what's going on with my case?" I mean, my clients call me all the time. They're not afraid to ask that question. But this, you have to understand this Murdoch mystique that existed. It's a reverence. When you have a family that has controlled the system for 100 years, let me give you a perfect example, Eric. After I got involved, I had to subpoena records from the probate court. I sent a subpoena. You know who I sent them to? A lady named P. Murdoch. When I had to subpoena the 911 tapes from Colleton County, not Hampton County, but Colleton, where the Mazelle property was, that farmhouse that you talked about, that went to an A period Murdoch. <laughs> so they're they're infested in the entire fabric of that community. And if you're gonna go question, you know, 
Mr. Murdoch um, and Mr. Fleming, you took my sister's case. What happened to it? And oh, by the way, I just read in the paper that there was a $505,000 settlement and no one's told us that. That is a big thing. You could do that in Charleston, but you don't do that in a small county. So they read that article, Eric, and it took them six months to get the courage to go see a lawyer to finally question. And fortunately, they went to Mark Tinsley because he was the Mallory Beach lawyer. And Mark said, look, you have to call my friend Eric Bland. And I got the phone call on September uh, 9th. On September 10th, I had signed up this family, and I didn't expect that there was money stolen. I just thought they, they may have a misunderstanding. So I'm not a lawyer that sends Hallmark cards, okay? The first card, you're, the communication you get from me isn't gonna be a pleasant Hallmark card. But in this particular case, I was measured. And I sent a letter to Alex and to Corey, and I said, look, I've been retained by the Satterfield family. They may be confused. The, the, they read that there was a $505,000 settlement, and they're telling me they got no money. So there must be an explanation. You probably have it in your trust account, or it's in an insurance policy, or it's with the court. Just let me know so I can assuage them of any concerns they have. No response. It, 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 it's a stunning no response because if you're a lawyer and somebody is writing you and saying, where is the money, the first thing you do is respond. I mean, because we're told three things in law school from day one till the third year. Don't lie to your clients, don't have sex with your clients, and don't steal their money. If you, do, if you don't do those three things, you'll be a lawyer for life. If you do one of those three things, you'll lose your ticket. No response. So that was on a Friday. On a Monday, I wrote him a more stern letter. And I said, you have till 3 o'clock today to tell me what happened to my client's money. No response. So we made the decision on Monday night to file a lawsuit that Tuesday morning because with the lawsuit, I would have subpoena power. And I would be able to subpoena all different insurance companies. When you were in that mode that, that day, that Monday... I was mad. Was was it, was it where you had to like you and Ronnie or whoever are sitting there Ronnie. talk? Okay, so you two, are you going? Well, maybe we shouldn't go this crazy yet. Maybe I mean, are you giving them a benefit of doubt? Or are you going? No, this is something's something's, like no, we're going after these guys. I mean, why I gave them the benefit of the doubt Friday, and Saturday, Sunday afternoon when I still didn't hear something. The hair goes on the back of your neck, but I gave them one more time, but. After 3 o'clock passed on Monday, and I knew that they received, because I have read and receipt on my emails, I knew they received my inquiries. And, and you don't know these guys? No. Okay. No, I don't. I've never met Corey Fleming, um, Alex Murdoch. I never knew who he was. And what I always find is interesting, because I've had friends you know, out west or wherever, non-South, South Carolina people say, yeah, those guys, that Murdoch family, they, like, run your state. They're the Kennedys. Like, and I'm like, uh, I've never even heard of them. No, it's not true. You know, every state in the country has a little hamlet or a little county where there's Murdochs that control it. We're, we're no different. The thing that has set this apart from every other kind of murder or theft case is this happened in the low country, Pat Conroy territory, beaches, Prince of Tides. It has all the earmarkings of a John Grisham novel that is true nonfiction. If John Grisham came here, he wouldn't have to write fiction. You have five people dead since 2015. You have stolen money. You have beautiful young kids. You know, Mallory Beach is a beautiful woman. You have a solicitor uh, that, that a family controlled the solicitor's office for 100 years dispensing out Southern justice. It has everything that fits into the stereotype of the South and that the system's rigged and the system's fixed. So I think that's what piqued the interest of the national media. And then when the national media and journalists like you do your job... Thank you for calling me a journalist. You are a journalist because you, you, you provide... News, you provide current events, topical, and you provide information, and you educate. And I'm funny. Yes, you have a great <laughs> sense of humor. And so when you talk about these things to a national audience, they're going to be interested. 
were they craved for attention whether it was the 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 two kids in florida who traveled to utah utah and lived in a van and they couldn't find that beautiful blonde we hook into that story we want to know how does it end well, because we can keep this story is so interesting. So I, I want to ask you a couple of things that I want to make sure I get across. the The day that um, Gloria Satterfield dies in so calls falls. Well, she fell on February tw- February second, and the and then co- dies the co- two days later or something. Three weeks later, February twenty sixth, and so she. Well, the, hold on, hold on. Give me a second. Mm-hmm. In your opinion, what happened? That day that she so supposedly we fell. don't know. All we well, what know. do you think happened? If you had based on what you've seen and what do you think went down that day? If you had to guess, I I think it happened some way that Alex described it on and Maggie did on the nine one one call that Maggie and Paul had a nine one call that the dogs uh, approached her. These stairs are steep; they're pointed brick. There's about eight steps, and maybe they caused her to trip, and she fell backwards, and they're pointed brick. She hit her head. Um, I think it happened some way like that. Now, it's interesting that a law, a legal claim came as a result of that because just because somebody may die on your property doesn't make you automatically liable. It doesn't mean there's a lawsuit. You would have to be negligent. And I think that Alex, from the minute he heard that Gloria died or fell, that he said, wow, we can make a claim against me, my homeowner's insurance, and I could get a recovery for these kids, but I'll steal some of their money. Because as we now know, Alex has been stealing money from his clients since 2010. You know, Eric, this law firm is so successful. When I tell you successful... They get between eight and ten eight-figure settlements or verdicts a year. So that's a tremendous amount of money coming into a law firm. And when you tell a client, well, we settled for $12 million, but maybe it's $14 million, or you falsify expenses, if you're handing a client a $4 million check or a $5 million check, and some of these clients are just hardworking people, they're going to be elated. Right. They're not going to ask, show me the audit trail. I want to know every single cent. The reason that the Satterfield case was different from every other case where Alex stole money is he stole every cent. The, it was a total of $4.3 million of settlements, which is an extraordinary amount for a 57-year-old woman that makes $11 an hour. Not that she's not worth it, but that case in Columbia or that case in Charleston would probably only be worth about a million and a half dollars. But if he would have just given the two, my two boys, the two heirs, $50,000, these kids make $15,000 a year. If he would have given them fifty or $75,000, they would have thought he hung the moon. And what happened is they called me on the phone. They finally got enough courage to say, we want to know what happened. And I promised them that I would give them answers and I was willing and my partner was willing to ask the hard questions and sue people ask questions of judges you know there's been a whole bunch of press now there's a complaint and a grievance that uh, David Pascoe a solicitor and I brought against Judge Carmen Mullen who approved these settlements but was never part of the court record we promised our clients we would get them answers And I promised my clients I was going to get them money. And I had to strike fast. I had to strike hard. I had to put my foot on people's throats. Because I believe that fast quarters are always better than slow dollars. So if I could hit these defendants, whether it was the Murdoch Law Firm, whether it was Corey Fleming and his law firm, whether it was Palmetto State Bank and Chad Wessendorf, if I can hit them hard, hit them fast, like a boxer punches somebody right out of the gate and stuns them. I knew that I would be able to get money quickly. And my clients, as it turns out, lost $4.3 million. You wouldn't have never known that because the first petition was only filed at $505,000, and then there was an additional $3.8 million once the excess 
carrier paid over the homeowner's coverage, we've recovered in excess of seven and a half million dollars, actual dollars, in my client's pocket. What um, was that like when you gave them the money? Um, it was it was rewarding in the sense that this housekeeper did not die in vain, that she died now for a purpose. Her death was the one that exposed Alex's fraud. When I came on board, I gave an interview. The right. N- Your the case, because of you and Ronnie. It became it, the hub. It, it, that, it, it blew up. I mean, everything the, fell. Everything fell. At the time, there was no information coming from SLED about the murders. There was no information about the Paul's charges, the Maori Beach boat charges. When we came on board, I gave an interview that night after we filed the lawsuit. And I said, this case is going to be the hub. Everything else is the spoke. And I said, by you know analogy, Al Capone went down for tax fraud. Al Capone didn't go down for murder. And I knew I had a linear case, an A to B case against Alex, direct evidence. Here's the money that went into Corey Fleming's account. Here's the money that was sent to this fake forge that was controlled by Alex, not forge consulting. Now, I want to ask you, regarding Corey, because mm-hmm. Alex... He just keeps showing up. Guilty. He's evil. He just shows up guilty. He's a dark. Do, he's he's a darkness. Do you think Corey just really was? I don't want to. I don't know what the right way to say this is. But do you think Corey almost was manipulated to think it's okay what, with what we're doing? Like um, I'm not going to say he's criminal, even though he's been charged by uh, has 18 pending charges against him. I'm not going to admit he's willfully blind. I'm not going to admit that he was a dunce. Um, He's far smarter than that. What happened is Corey, who was Alex's best friend, who went to high school and college with Alex, who became godfather to Paul, he got caught up in Alex's vortex, all this money. And when there was a multi-defendant case or a multi-party case, Alex would bring Corey in. And Corey would get a small part of it. And so... Corey was a, just a normal defense lawyer. His wife is a public defender. But now Corey's hobnobbing in big eight-figure settlements where maybe his client out of a $15 million settlement is getting $2 million. And so I think he trusted Alex, but, he, but that trust pulls you out to sea. And you have to have your instincts about you as a lawyer to know that I'm entering into territory where I shouldn't. I have to exercise my diligence. So the answer is I don't believe that he was an unwitting victim. I don't believe he was victimized by Alex. I believe he knew exactly what was going on because he didn't dispense any of his duties to the Satterfields. And they took my client out of the seat as personal representative and put the biggest dunce banker in the world, Chad Westendorf, to become the PR who doesn't even ask one single question. And so when you have somebody in the PR seat and you can manipulate that person, then they were able to do everything that they could do. And my clients received zero dollars, Eric, from four point three million. Guys, you're listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. We're gonna take a quick break, but we'll be right back. Attention. Attention. Do you own a whole life or universal life insurance policy? Were you told to expect a big tax-free nest egg at retirement or that dividends will pay for the policy instead of you? Agents frequently sell products like this that are profitable for them, but not for you. Let Double E audit your policy at no cost. Call now to find out how Double E Insurance and Financial Solutions can help you. 843-936-6352. Double E LLC.com. Securities offered through Fortune Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Elkins Financial, Double E LLC, and Fortune Financial Services, Inc. are separate entities. Guys, welcome back, and thank you for tuning in to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. We're sitting here talking to Eric Bland, the attorney that basically opened up the whole Murdoch case in South Carolina. And um, you're just, I see the passion in your eyes. I mean, I see when I asked you about, you know, what, what were those those boys like when they got that check? You can just see it. You know, you take it, they took advantage of kids who lost their mother. They took advantage of the memory of a housekeeper who raised their kids. Um, 
One of my clients is, um, he, he's a vulnerable adult. He has some special needs. Um, the other one is a trusting kid. They, they felt like they were an extended family members of the Murdoch family. So they, none of them could ever imagine that Alex would do this. Uh, Ginger and Eric went to school with Alex Murdoch from first grade all the way through high school. Eric um, knew Alex well that they would see each other and they would be on a first name basis. Uh, two weeks before the boys came to see me, Alex bought quail from Scott Harriet, one of Gloria's brothers. So they could never have forecasted or thought that Alex would steal money from them. But the way it turned out is they he used their mother's death, their sister's death, as a vehicle to recover millions of dollars. And a lawyer should never use a client's case to enrich themselves or a friend. That's the crown jewel of the client, the lawsuit. Let me ask you this. When it came to, and I'm curious, you know, I asked you what I felt, what you felt like happened when Gloria passed away. What do you think happened when Maggie and Paul, which Maggie, again, is the wife of Alec, and Paul is the son, who also was indicted for the boat crash and the death of uh, Mallory Beach. What do you think happened that night? Who do you think killed them? Well, I'm, I'm not going to be a, a, a criminal defense lawyer here and, and go out on a limb, but I will say that I'm confident that criminal charges are coming, and I think they're coming now sooner rather than later. And I do believe that Alex is going to be the recipient of those criminal charges. Now, whether he is the person who's going to be charged as being the killer of Maggie and Paul, I do not know. But I know that Mandy Matney wrote an article last month that said there's direct evidence that links Alex to the murders of Paul and Maggie. She would not have gone out on that limb and, and, and put her credibility at issue because her credibility is at an all-time high because everything that she writes about is true. Um, so I think we're going to see charges against Alex, some aspect of it, whether he's a conspiracy uh, to commit murder or whether he knew that his wife and his son were going to be killed because I think the bigger question is, what was Alex doing? What was he doing with Cousin Eddie? Why, why do we hear the name the Cowboys, who are a, a low country gang? How could he have gone through... $14 million, you know, Dick uh, uh, likes to say that he had an opioid addiction. Dick or polio. Right. There isn't five elephants that could consume as much. Um, do, you even th do you even think he had an opiate addiction? Um, whether he had an opioid addiction, I think he did take opioids. I think there's real evidence of that, and I think that we'll find out that maybe Cousin Eddie assisted him in obtaining um uh, Opioids, not just prescription opioids, but um, obviously opioids that were not by prescription. But I think what we're going to find out from Cousin Eddie, because cousin, I uncovered that Cousin Eddie was the recipient of almost $3 million of separate checks from Alex Murdoch from 2018 up to the week before Maggie and Paul were shot. And I think what we're going to find is that Cousin Eddie... Cousin got, Eddie is related... What what what, what rela distant uh, distant somehow cousin and to Alex? Let but, me well but, can, hold on. I'm going to ask you this one question. It's very important, and it was a question that came up. If he got three million from Alex, he doesn't drive a Mercedes. He doesn't have a wh beach house. Wh why why why, can't he, why didn't he get a haircut or anything? Well, I think what we're going to find is that what did he do with the money? I think he was laundering it for Alex. I think Alex, in his way laundered the money through the Forge account and through his different bank accounts, it's going to come out that he would go to many different Bank of America branches to deposit money or he would do telephone deposits, violated every uh, kind of common practice that banks should do. But the checks would then be payable to Cousin Eddie. Cousin Eddie, like I said, doesn't drive a Mercedes, doesn't wear a slick suit like you do, doesn't have a $200 haircut like you do. Um, Thank you. I think he deposited those checks in different banks and then would cat turn them to cash. 
he would get a small percentage, and that money would go back to Alex. And but I, what? That's the thing. The what did Alex? do with this money i think you're going to find out when these criminal charges come and i'm just speculating that alex in order to fund his whatever drug addiction he had or maybe all these different properties because one of the things that i'm going to talk about in five minutes is these lawyers at the murdoch firm and alex own thousands of acres in hampton county and when i say thousands i mean like five thousand per person, per lawyer. I think it went into buying land, and you've probably read articles that Alex was representing the Bulwares, and Bulware was a, a notorious drug dealer during the 80s and 90s. In fact, the Mazel property where Gloria was killed and where Paul and Maggie were murdered was owned by the Bulwares. Mm. And Alex got that property from Bulware before he died. So I think what's going to end up happening... I think that, and I'm just speculating as an armchair uh, uh, interested viewer like you are, that these were either revenge killings or they were blackmail killings. And I think that Alex may have been being may have been blackmailed for money, and may have stopped paying people money, and somebody was sending a horrific message. Um, now, Paul was a redhead. The Murdochs have a lot of red in their hair in their and redheads can be hotheads, and the reputation of Paul was that he was a vicious alcoholic when he was drunk. Uh, when he was drunk, he was a vicious alcoholic who had a temper. Ordinarily, when he wasn't drinking, he was supposedly an easygoing guy, but the reputation is when he was drinking, he was um, quite volatile. And don't forget, he was under house arrest at Mazel after the Mallory Beach charges were brought in May. And... Um, he may have been frustrated. He may have been scared. The story's going to come out. Now, it would have come out much sooner, but so, for me, but for me uncovering all these financial crimes and then all the other financial crimes happening, SLED and the FBI for the last five months has been solving a, a, a massive amount of financial fraud. You know, there. When I got involved, Eric, on September, how often are you? T did you? T or are you still talking to the FBI and SLED? I talked to SLED. Uh, through the AG's office, I talk to the Attorney General, Creighton Waters, probably once every week. Um, uh, I've been cooperating with the FBI. Every document that I get that's relevant, I turn over to them. Um, and here's the story I wanted to tell you. I get emails and I get text messages and messages to my website from all over the country, from a lot of different people. And some of them, some of the people say, I know where the weapons are. You take 12 steps outside of the barn and you're going to find them. But I remember getting this email from somebody in Florida who told us, I've gone through all these different property transactions, and you're not going to believe how Murdoch's tied with Bulware and a lot of these other unsavory characters. And in, in, in this Bulware family, they live in South Carolina? Yeah, yeah. They were low country people, and they imported uh, or they brought in bales and bales of marijuana through Florida, through the waterways of Florida up the East Coast hundreds of tons of marijuana. And so when I started getting be getting involved with the FBI, they said to me, you know, we're trying to figure out all these different property transfers because Mark Tinsley and I and John Lay, who's the receiver, an attorney in Columbia who we got appointed to be the receiver for Alex's assets, it's so difficult to trace Alex's property. I mean, it would come in his hands and then out a week later. And the FBI says to me, we can't even figure it out. Now, if the FBI can't figure it out. That's crazy. And in my head, I said, you know what? I remember getting this email. This is just some stranger that sends you an email? From a lady in Florida. And I said, I think I'm going to call her. Well, it turns out that this lady, who now works for the FBI, was a retired executive vice president for State Farm. She's a lawyer. She was never married. She retired a year ago and went to take care of her mother in Florida and became fascinated with the Murdoch thing. So she spends every minute of every day searching the public records in really? Culleton, Buford, and Hampton County. She knows every single transaction that every single member of the Murdoch law firm, every lawyer, has done, and every single transaction at Corey Fleming, Moss Coonan Fleming, the bankers Russ Lafitte, 
and she now works for the FBI and SLED and assists them in understanding how to unravel where all this money went. Well, are you allowed to say who that is? No, or? I'm not. She doesn't. She's never given her name publicly. So she hasn't gone on any podcast. She has not. Uh, but she is just a brilliant woman. Wow. And, yeah. And she did it all from her computer in Florida getting into the public And this records. all just comes about. The FBI hears about this woman due to you going, wait a minute, let me reach out to this woman. I did. And then I get, every day I get different tips. You know, I was able to find out everything about what happened to the Satterfields. A lot of it came from tips that I got by text, by email, and on our website, and I found out within a week and a half of going on TV that they actually stole $4.3 million. And I got documents to support it, and I took those documents to SLED, who then brought criminal charges before a grand jury based on what I provided them. You know, Chief Keel for SLED, the, the director of SLED, didn't make any comments before I came on board. After I got on board, that Sunday following Tuesday when I filed the lawsuit, he said, we're opening a criminal investigation into the money theft of the Satterfield $4.3 million and a criminal investigation into the death of Gloria Satterfield. That's unbelievable. All right, so let me ask you this. Um, I don't want to... Because of your success with Gloria Satterfield, you, you notice I have to keep petting my dog this whole time, or he's That's gonna. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, I'm a dog man. I have two English bulldogs. Um, are are the other people, the Mallorys of the world, the Stephen Smiths of the world, are you start? Are are you guys getting where they're, they're reaching out to you, going, "Hey, can you help us with our case, like you did with Gloria?" Well, I have other victims. Um, of Alex's theft. I'm involved in several other cases where uh, Alex stole money from, from them and then the law firm has um, given them some of their money back that they lost, but they haven't made them whole. Um, one of the things that we're challenging is that when you give somebody back money that they should have received <coughs> six years ago, you should pay them interest. What is the interest rate on it? Well, it would is be, it prime or something? Yeah, where you look at the return on the stock market. The other thing is, in South Carolina, if you're a fiduciary and you steal money from a client, you should not keep that legal fee that you earned. So, if I like, if I'm a doctor and I do surgery on you, and I'm not really a doctor, and I collect from the insurance company, even though I took out your appendix the right way, I can't keep the money. If I'm a person that's selling a house for your, your assistant, and I collect a commission, and I'm not actually a real estate agent, I'm not entitled to keep a commission. The same should apply to a lawyer. If a lawyer who steals money from a client, they should forfeit the fee back to the client. And so we're testing that on a number of cases. Well, what's the deal, though? Do you have Dick Harpoolian saying that Alec has no money? Yeah, Dick's saying that Alec has no money. That's, that's not true. Alec does have money question is, is it touchable? He's got a retirement account that has over $2 million. You, the public's going to hear, and this is a breaking news for Eric Elkins on the Ladies and gentlemen, account. ladies and gentlemen. Um, Alex's father died three days after Paul and Maggie died. He had cancer. And he left a trust for his four children that it has about $4 million to get funded for each of the children. So I've just identified over $6 million now, it's beyond the reach of creditors, a retirement account and a trust. But John Lay and Peter McCoy, who are the receivers, have already brought in almost a million, $2 million worth of property that Alex tried to transfer out of his name, and it's coming back into a victim's fund. Now, I told you one of the things that I wanted was accountability and an apology. And you remember in the beginning, Dick Harputlian said, well, Alex didn't do this, or other people did it, and Alex is not responsible, or he even tried to advance the proposition. Well, Bland has collected enough money so far, more than $4.3 million, so Alex is off the hook. Alex has now confessed judgment. We'll do it. It's before court now to get approved to my clients in the amount of $4.3 million. So in addition to the in excess of $7.5 million that we have cash in hand, Alex is giving a judgment, acknowledging 
that he stole $4,305,000. It was symbolic for me to get a judgment for $4,305,000. So not only are my clients the first people to get dollar one from Alex, but they're the first people to get a real judgment against them. And so what's going to happen is at the end of this process, John Lay is going to say, I've, I've uncovered and recovered as much money as I can. And so there's this pot of money. And people are going to have to apply to the court to be able to get money from that fund. Now, obviously, some victims may not get any money. So a judge may say to us when we apply for our $4.3 million judgment, look, you guys have gotten, it's a number in excess of $7.5 million. I can't tell you how much because I'm contractually bound not to say it. But it's a, hard, it's a high number. And a judge may say, well, you're, you only lost $4.3 million. And in reality, if everything was paid, your clients were only going to get $2.75 million because there would be a legal fee. But you guys have now recovered in excess of $7.5 million. I may only let you collect 15 or 20% of that $4.3 million judgment. But my clients have received life-changing money. They're being smart. That money is... Uh, being um, invested prudently by a friend of ours, and I think you know who that friend is. It's Rick Magliori at Merrill Lynch. Um, they're protected from people coming and preying on them to say, can you lend me money or anything like that? We don't want them to be the lottery winner to go through all their money in two years. They're, you know, There's good hand guardrails for them, and they're going to make a donation in the name of Gloria Satterfield to a very worthy charity in Hampton County. So when I told you that Gloria did not die in vain, I'm telling you she did not, and her name will live in uh, will live in infamy. But because there's so many suits against Alec, and it keeps happening, like mm -hmm. there's just somebody else coming after Plus them. Plus 78 criminal charges for a total of over 900 years if convicted. Okay. W one... That's before the federal government there's comes not a, in. Because I don't think it's a stretch that you would believe there's probably an income tax fraud committed somewhere that Alex wouldn't have reported the $14 million he stole. Wouldn't you, You'd be surprised oh. if he put that on his tax returns, wouldn't you? I'm sure. I, I mean, it, but my, my thing is, where, how are the, I don't see how all these people are going to get this money. One, because they keep going with the story he doesn't have all this money. Well, you look at different parties. You know, I looked at his law firm in addition to Alex because his law firm has a partners have a duty to supervise each other. How is it that he could steal this money over a 10 year period of time? If, if, if your partners are watching out for each other or you have proper protocols for escrow accounts and accounting, money should come in. You should be able to account for it. It should be audited periodically. So we would argue, and all these victims are going to argue, there was a failure to supervise by the Murdoch firm. Then, And what about that firm? Those guys, that's I a whole nother case, because I, these guys got to be shitting bricks right now, wondering what... I, I think they're scared. They obviously have changed the name of the Murdoch law firm, and they've taken the name out, and it's now known as the Parker Law Group. Johnny Parker uh, is one of the best trial law lawyers our state ever had. Um, he single-handedly has brought down... CSX Railroad, we could talk for hours about how our legislator changed the laws because companies like Walmart and the CSX Railroad said, unless you change the venue laws, unless we cannot be hailed into a court in Hampton County for an accident that happens in Greenwood or an accident that happens in Myrtle Beach, how Piggly Wiggly gets hauled into a court in Hampton County, unless you change the venue law, we're going to leave this state. Uh, Walmart actually bought property in Hampton County and has never opened a Walmart in Hampton County because of the Murdoch Law Firm. And in 2005, our state changed the venue laws so that if you get in an accident in Greenville, that's where the accident has to take place unless the principal place of business is in Hampton County. Because what used to happen is if I was in a Piggly Wiggly and I reached up to get a loaf of bread, and the whole shelf came down on me. I could sue in Hampton County because there was a Piggly Wiggly in Hampton County. As long as they owned property, you could sue. And so what all these lawyers around the state would do would get a case in, 
and then call up Johnny Parker or Mark Ball or Ronnie Crosby and say, hey, I got this great case. Lady got in a wreck. She car went across the railroad tracks. The SS tr uh, train came and hit her. They would bring the case in Hampton County. And there's been so many high verdicts there that if the case came in Hampton County, they would pay millions of dollars oh, to settle the case. It's terrible, man. It, it's, it's it was it's listen disgusting. to me. In 2003, Hampton County was ranked the number three judicial hellhole in the country, and that's all over Alabama, Mississippi, Cook County, Illinois, Hampton County, South Carolina was ranked by the ABA, the American Bar Association, as the third worst judicial hellhole in our country. Well, on that note, guys, you're listening to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. This is Eric Elkins sitting here talking to Eric Bland. I'm the owner of Double E Financial, and um, he is just spewing information, and I still got more stuff to ask him that I don't want to make sure, I don't want to leave out. But before that, we're going to hear from our sponsor. We'll be right back. If you're like most successful business executives, you would probably rather stick your arm in a bucket of snakes than formulate a strategy for your insurance and financial needs. Who even understands estate planning, 401k plans, or key men insurance? We do. We are Double E, your virtual chief insurance and financial officer. Let us free you up to do more of what you do best and less of what we do better. Call 843-936-6352, doubleellc.com. Securities offered through Fortune Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Elkins Financial, Double E, LLC, and Fortune Financial Services, Inc. are separate entities. Guys, welcome back to the Shrimp Tank Charleston podcast. We're sitting here talking to Eric Bland, one of the attorneys that blew up the Murdoch case that became a national story regarding what he's done for the Satterfield family and, and what he's doing for a lot of other people that have been, unfortunately, um, hurt by this family over the course of God knows how many years. But luckily, Eric stands up, and he goes after it, and he doesn't care, and he basically makes people uh, be accountable, which no, is I what care. they do. No, I mean, you, you, I didn't mean it that way. I meant you make them accountable, accountable right. period. Okay, I got questions. We, we got a bunch of fan mail that we get in, and these were some questions that, that came in that people wanted us to ask you, Eric. So l let me first go into this. I haven't reviewed all the questions. Kristen gave me this about 10 minutes before we walked in We're going to do rapid fire? Somewhat of a rapid fire, unless you really want to give a long answer. But, I won't. But don't go too long. First question, is Joe from Lexington, South Carolina, your area, do you think Stephen Smith... And Buster Murdaugh were lovers. Well, that's just pure speculation. But what, what, what does, do you think? I, I don't know, and I wouldn't make that statement. That's not fair to Stephen. It's not fair to Buster. What I can tell you is it is strange that both Corey Fleming and Randall Murdaugh, after Stephen's death, became part of representing the Smith family or, or trying to represent the Smith family. I don't understand how Randolph Murdoch would want to get involved. In who is Randolph? Is he a brother? The, he's a brother who is at the Murdoch law firm right now. So he's Alex's brother. Alex's brother, who's a great lawyer, and there's no allegations that he's done anything inappropriate. But how Randolph Murdoch and Corey Fleming would take an interest in just a young boy that died and they found him on the road. Um, certainly the circumstances of the head injuries and uh, no skid marks and, you know, there's, there's assertions and allegations that maybe he was brought there after he was killed. I don't know the connection, but there, is some, there has to be some connection that we're not seeing to have both Randolph and Corey Fleming somehow wanting and calling the Smiths to represent them. You heard it there. Um, that's a, I think that's a good answer. Okay, next one is from Mary Ann from Dallas, Texas. Were you, did you ever work or do any business with Dick Harpoolian and Jim Griffin? Did y'all ever do any cases together was her question. Absolutely. Um, Dick is a 
probably a lion of our bar will go down in history as probably one of the five to ten best lawyers we ever had. I actually bought Dick his first computer system when he left the solicitor's office in 1994. And from about 94 to about 1999, Dick and I did a lot of civil cases together. Dick was a criminal lawyer at the time, and I was the workhorse for cases that he had. And we had, you know, it was a very, very uh, beneficial relationship, and we were friends. Jack Swirling, Dick, and I used to go get uh, coffee and tea every afternoon at, tea. The, old, at the old elite. <laughs> I drank tea. I don't drink coffee. At the old elite Epicurean, we used to oh, go three. Delicious. Um, and then when my partner Ronnie Richter left his cousin Larry Richter, Ronnie and I were best friends. Um, I used to do a lot of cases with Larry, and I was told to stay away from Ronnie because Ronnie was leaving Larry's office to go on his own. When I said I was going to go into partnership with Ronnie, which we did in 1998, my relationship with Dick kind of waned because he had to be loyal to Larry. I mean, there was a very tight-knit community of Pete Strom, Joe McCullough, Jack Swirling, um, Larry, and Ronnie. So from about 1999 to 2008, I didn't do too much with Dick on a legal basis. In 2008, we started doing cases together, and we were really good friends. We exchanged Christmas gifts every year. This was the first year we didn't exchange Christmas gifts. Um, I used to be invited to his Christmas party, and not this year. Maybe we'll break bread when all this is over with. Jim Griffin is an absolutely brilliant lawyer. Um, I think he's even smarter than Dick. Uh, and he and Dick work on cases together. Jim and I worked on uh, a case together involving Toomey Hospital where we got a really good result. Jim is, a, uh, I'd like to think, a good friend of mine and still a friend. It's strained this relationship because of this case, but I'm hopeful in the future that we'll be able to get back uh, close to a relationship we had before. I don't think it'll ever be the same, though, because, you know, we threw a lot of fastballs in this case at each other. Dick tried to, you know, he's reported me to the Supreme Court because of uh, some of the statements I made in the press. He, he, he argued that I violated the pretrial publicity rule and I prejudiced his client. And I came back and said that Dick Harputlian, um, he, he was a numbskull for standing up in court and admitting crimes that his client committed. And I said, you know, nothing could be worse than his own lawyer standing up in court saying that he's going to go away for many years in prison and he knew it. So uh, I've said some harsh things about Dick. Um, I really haven't said a lot about Jim, but he, uh, you know, it's, again, high fastballs and they threw him at me and, you know, they filed a motion to gag me with the court. But I think everything, as time goes on, will look back on it and realize that this was a seminal case. It, it's going to go down in our state's history as probably the most famous case. It's, I think it's going to exceed Susan Smith. I think it, it, it may not exceed the uh, manual nine, God forbid, Dylan Roof. That was horrific. Uh, but in its own way, it will exceed Susan Smith. Pee Wee Gaskins, it'll be the most famous case that our state uh, has ever seen. And Dick and Jim and I and Ronnie were all part of it. And Mark Tinsley and Joe McCullough. Okay. Um, if uh, Is this Bobby from Utah or Bobby from Colorado? No. <laughs> no, I, I lost my, my place on my notes. I'm so sorry. I'm, I am a journalist. Um, what did do you uh, and I just don't know the answer. This is I'm sorry. This is David from Peoria. I, well, that's the second time we've had Peoria, Illinois. It's so weird that that comes from there. Mm -hmm. David says, "What is the son doing now?" The 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 son that Buster. Yes, I think Buster unfortunately is going to have to change his name. Buster, I'm not saying that. Murdoch is Adolf Hitler, but it has that same, when you hear that Hitler name, it's so harsh, it's, it's fingernails on a backboard. The Murdoch name is the same way. That's why the law firm changed their name to the Parker Law Group. Unfortunately, Buster is a victim. He lost his mother, he lost his brother, and he's going to lose his father because his father's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. Buster went to law school. Um, there, the question is, how did he leave law school? He, he was asked to leave. We don't know the circumstances. Some say there was a, 
an incident of plagiarism. I do not know that. Um, I don't know whether that's true or not, but I do know he left law school. He, he was at the PGA Championship a couple weeks ago because I think he uh, works for an alcohol company and they were a sponsor. Um, but he also put himself in the limelight because the day I argued against Alex getting bond on December 13th, when the criminal charges came out. The state only wanted Alex to get a $200,000 bond. And Ronnie and I argued that he shouldn't be able to get bond at all, that he's a danger to the community, that he was a flight risk. And Judge Newman um, agreed with us and Alex didn't get bond. That very minute that he was in court, his brother John Marvin and Buster were at a table at the Bellagio playing blackjack and that picture was plastered all over the news. And so it gave the impression that Buster was not interested in his father. And I will tell you as a side note, it was the most surreal thing uh, to be in court when Alex came out in chains on December 13th for his bond hearing. He, he came out and the courtroom was packed, double courtroom, they opened the doors and there was 100 cameras there. And I had to get up and speak, you know, and I said to myself, you know, if I trip over my words, I'll be the laughing stock of the world. You know, it, it, you feel your heart pounding. The, the way you felt when you walked in here today. Yeah. Well, Alex walks out and he's in cuffs and he's staring out in the audience. And you see, he's looking and looking. And he's looking for a friend. He's looking for a family member. He's looking for anybody that was there to support him. And there was nobody. There wasn't a family member. There wasn't a friend. His law partners weren't there. And he, he lowered his head. And I, when I got up, I said, he's a despicable human being. You know, you, you represent the worst in lawyers. Um, and he just had his head down. And at the very same time, Buster was um, at de Bellagio. So you ask me, well, did Alex, did Alex have something to do with killing his children? The answer I, I can give you is, if he didn't know who killed his wife and his son, he would never let Buster, his only living son, or his family members walk the street. If it was a random killing and he had no idea why people were killing his wife and kid, he would round up his only living son and his brothers, and he'd go to law enforcement and say, these people have to be protected. But he knows that Buster walks the streets of Columbia, where he lives, alone. Now, no father would let their son, their only living son, walk the streets if he felt that he was in any kind of danger. So that should be telling for you. That was a great point to end this conversation. If you had to guess, we're, we're fast forward, we're three years from now. What's different, what's new about this case that you think, if you're looking at the fortune teller, well, I think Alex at that point is going to be a cooperating witness. He's looking at so much time. The feds haven't even started. I think people like Corey Fleming will cooperate. Corey is not cooperating right now. Cousin Eddie, I'm told, is cooperating. I think we'll know the full extent in three years of what happened to Alex's money, that 14 or so million that he, that he has misappropriated and stolen. Actually stolen, I'm not using that sweet term misappropriation, he's a thief, um, that he stole. Um, I think we'll, we'll have the answers about uh, Maggie and Paul's killings. I think we'll have accountability for the Mallory Beach uh, boating accident. I'm telling you, people have described the way Ronnie and I lit litigate as being like Fallujah every day. But Mark Tinsley is a lawyer that has been described that he will suck the marrow out of your bones. I think Mark Tinsley is going to hold the Parker Group responsible, the convenience store. I think everybody in that chain that contributed to, Bu to Buster and Paul getting alcohol that night um, are going to be held accountable, so we'll know all that. I think we may find out more about Stephen Smith. Um, but I think at that point in time, the system will be cleansed. You know, the best disinfectant is sunlight. The more journalists like you ask questions and interview people, the more that it, the public is going to demand accountability. You know, we used to have a state where things would happen in the dark. The devil works in the dark. God and 
honesty and truth works in the sunlight. And I think we're going to have sunlight, and I think the soul, the justice system is going to be completely different. I think when there's settlement hearings, they're going to be in court and on court record. They're not going to be out of a ch in a judge's chambers without a court record. So I think a lot of things are going to be changed for the better in three years, and I hope I'm still a lawyer at that time. What, what, what does your life look like? In three years? Uh, it's kind of the same. You know, I'm a, I love my wife. I'm kind of boring. I'm, I'm either found at... Do you think your arms are a little more flabby? No, no. Mm -hmm. I'm either found at the gym, on a golf course, at home, or at work. I mean, I'm You're still playing from the, the yellow tees? Yeah, I play from... Yeah, the, the women's tees. Kind of. <laughs> but no, I, no I, I think in three years, uh, I'm going to be in a new office building in Lexington. Uh, you know, I do a lot of real estate deals. Um, I'm definitely in the fourth quarter of my legal career. There's no question about it. I think I'll still be a lawyer, um, and I'm hopeful to uh, be doing other things. I mean, I'm going to do be on your side of the microphone uh, in a couple months. I'm doing a podcast, hopefully, that's going to be called A Cup of Justice. I have opportunities. Do you want to have me on? I will. I have opportunities to be a legal analyst on different shows like Jeffrey Tubin and, and others who have done that. And my partner. What kind of I, money do you make when you're an analyst like that? They, they can pay you $500 or $1,000 appearance. And my partner and I are writing a book about this. Really? Called Collision Course. And we, so. Our entire careers have been on a collision course with Alex and my partner and I. And it all culminated in September of last year. When can we expect that book, Collision Course? Get with my partner, Ronnie. He's really the ghost writer for it. He's literally doing the writing. Yeah, yeah, he's brilliant. He's brilliant. Uh, just good. amazing writer. Will you flex on the front cover? Just you show your arms <laughs> on no, the cover? I won't do that, but I'll wear a nice enough suit that you can know that I, I still can bench press 115 pounds. Um, I'd, I would never doubt it. Ladies and gentlemen, I think you, I, you know, the first, the first Rocky, the first episode we had Eric on, and he talks about the Ric Flair experience, which people stop me all the time. I get emails, I get texts, I send them to you. I don't even know some of these people who are sending me stuff. Um, which, if you, if you enjoyed this interview, you should go back and listen to the first one we ever did because he, he knocked it out of the park then, just like he knocked it out of the park today. If you didn't know a lot about the Murdoch case, I think you probably got a lot better understanding due to Eric's candid openness talking about it. So first, I'm very thankful that you came on again. I'd do anything for you, my brother. I love you. And two, um, I'm glad Chris Cuomo's didn't take over my my spot. I know that there was a lot of love. should try there. to get it. I should take over his job. At 9 o'clock. CNN, I'm available if you, you need me. Guys, you just listened to Eric Bland, the famous attorney that you sh everyone, if you're ever in trouble, he is, he's my attorney. Uh, luckily, I don't have to uh, have him deal with a lot of crazy stuff. But if you have something going on, that's who I would call because he, he's going he's gonna to get it right. He's going to fix things. But you got to make sure that, you, that uh, you're honest and upfront with him. Great show today. Gus, thank you. Kristen, Thanks, Gus. our producer, thank you, Kristen. great show. If you want to listen to other shows or watch the video portion of the show, please take advantage of YouTube, iTunes, Google, Spotify, iHeartRadio. We're also on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Again, I'm Eric Elkins. Lastly, if you think or you know of someone that is an entrepreneur or someone making an impact in our world like an Eric Plan, then please contact our producer, Kristen Kilman, at 843-936-6353. Again, 843-936-6353. Nine three six six three five three. Or if you need a key man life insurance policy or a second to die, Eric Elkins, in all seriousness, insures my family, insures my estate, and he's insured my wife and my life for about 20 years. I would not trust any other person other than Double E Financial. Thank you so much for the plug. Or go to our website, www.shrimptankpodcast.com slash Charleston, or you can go to our company website, www.elllc.com. I'm Eric Elkins. Thank you so much and keep at it. I've been feeling like a shark in a shrimp tank. Big fish, small pond.